You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> This story was produced as part of the Wicked Writing Online class held by author Megan J. Meehan. If you like this story and are interested in taking a future class, please email Megan at megan at chillingtalesfordarknights.com for more details. Her email is in the description box below. Enjoy the story. As long as you feed it by Michaela Smith, performed by Otis Jiry. This morning, before I left for work, I went out to refill my bird feeder on the balcony. To my horror, there was blood and feathers underneath for the umpteenth time that month. As always, I briefly wondered if maybe a cat or something had gotten them, except I didn't have a cat and my apartment was on the third floor with no trees in sight. This frequent occurrence had plagued me for some time, but I decided there wasn't time to figure it out and be on time for work, so I left with a sick feeling in my stomach once again. Work was kind of hazy. I walked around in a bit of a daze as I went through the motions, putting on my apron, taking orders, etc. The diner that I worked at was fairly laid back, and rarely very busy, so my almost robotic act was of no consequence. As closing time rolled around, I went into my default mode of wiping down the counter. No one was in the diner, so I continued to let my mind mull over what had kept happening to those poor birds. Miss? I jumped. The man who walked in and sat down on a bar stool startled me out of my daze. <laughs> Long day, he chuckled. Yeah, <laughs> I sighed and half-heartedly chuckled back, slightly annoyed that someone had come in only a half hour before we closed. What can I get for you? He smiled and asked, Do you have any pie left? Without hesitation, I listed them off. We have apple, cherry, blueberry. I'll take a slice of that apple pie. Whipped cream? Yes, please. He smiled again. I promptly went back into the kitchen and returned with a crudely cut slice of apple pie covered with a hefty amount of whipped cream. Thank you, he said, as I set the plate down in front of him, and I'm sorry for coming in so close to closing time. I must not have been hiding my annoyance very well, which kind of made me feel bad, because the way he said it made it seem obvious that this guy wasn't a total asshole. I continued my closing duties as he ate. When he finished, he left the money for the pie in a rather generous tip and left without saying a word. Okay, then, I muttered to myself, and took care of the leftover dish, locked up, turned the lights off, and headed out the back. As I proceeded to walk out of my car, I heard a familiar voice. Miss, he startled me again this time because it was dark and no one was around rather than just me zoning out. I turned around as he bent down and picked up my keys off of the ground. I think he dropped these. He handed them to me and I thanked him. Suspicion rose in me, but before I could finish my thought of wondering why he had followed me to the back of the diner, something hard was slammed against the back of my head and I was out cold. I was awoken by a bump in the road. Jesus, Alejandro, slow down, complained the voice of whom I had originally thought wasn't an asshole. Alejandro, who I assumed to be the man driving, said nothing. He drove on for a few more minutes before the car jerked to a halt. I heard the rear doors open, and I was dragged out of the car by my restrained arms and forced to stand upright. The bag over my head was yanked off. I looked around frantically, but all I saw was greenery. No houses, no people, not even a city skyline. I tried to scream through the duct tape over my mouth, but it was no use. No one came. My captors didn't even try to stop me. My heart sank. I was terrified. When they turned me around, I saw a small church in the middle of the clearing. 
was one of those Gothic-style churches. It wasn't as grand as a cathedral, but I still admire the design. I was dragged in its direction by a man who wasn't the one I had met at the diner. I thought maybe it had been the driver until I heard the driver's side door open. The man who was dragging me looked back and grinned at me. But unlike the man at the diner, this one made my skin crawl and probably would have had the same effect even if he wasn't kidnapping me. I'm glad we got a pretty one for this, he said. Stephen, the man from the diner who was walking ahead of us warned. Stephen ignored him and pulled me close. I'm going to enjoy watching you scream while it rips you apart, he whispered menacingly. Not two seconds after trying to intimidate me, Alejandro came up from behind, grabbed Stephen and lifted him up by the collar of his shirt. Our driver was rather tall and looked to be a bit of a brute. Come on, man, Stephen pleaded. Alejandro stayed silent and glared at the smaller, rather scrawny man. Are you two done screwing around? The man from the diner asked impatiently. Alejandro dropped the scrawny and now almost trembling man on his ass. He then scooped me up in his arms and carried me the rest of the way. My quivering ceased slightly as I felt oddly safe. Well, not really, but you know what I mean. I can't really say that I liked any of these bastards, but I can safely say which one of them I disliked the least. Hey! I yelled to a man from the diner, but it came out muffled and incoherent through the duct tape. Alejandro painfully but quickly ripped it off, and I followed with a loud, Ow! and then thanked him kindly. What? Why'd you bring me out here? I could hear my voice shaking, but I did my best to sound more angry than scared. I didn't want to give Stephen the satisfaction of my terror. What are you going to do with me? The man from the diner made no effort to face me and kept on as he answered. Be patient, my dear. I cringed as Stephen cackled and said, Oh, David, you're no fun. David opened the door to reveal a white towel floor and several rows of polished wooden pews. As we walked down the aisle, I realized how nice and well kept this place was for being out in the middle of nowhere. The stained glass windows were striking as they were lit up by the moonlight, and I briefly wondered how pretty this place must look like in the daytime. Alejandro laid me down on the altar and walked away and up the staircase on the right side. So, now that we're all settled, would you still care to know why you're here? David asked. Oh, no, no, I replied sarcastically although less confidently now that the big guy that had kept me away from Stephen was gone. I actually enjoyed being kidnapped and then placed on altars like some sort of satanic sacrifice. David chuckled very much like he had when I first met him. Well, sacrifice is certainly close enough, he began. You see, we have in our possession a rather interesting thing. He paced around the altar and continued. We were out and about one day, never mind what we were doing. But we stumbled upon a rather uh, fearsome-looking thing. He nodded towards Stephen, who scoffed when he said, This one pissed himself. He rested his hands on the altar on either side of my head. It was very menacing, the way it was, looking at us. When the thing lunged at us, we ran and decided to take shelter in the back of our van. Then I got an idea. He looked down at me, smiling again. You see, we had a, let's call her a stowaway, in the back of our van. I wanted to be sure exactly what this creature's intentions were, so I uh, let her loose. Stephen was off in a corner chuckling darkly to himself. As you can imagine, the things we heard and saw were rather gruesome. Steve gave me that bone-chilling grin again. It ate her. David continued on. We soon realized that once it had fed, it didn't seem interested in us anymore, and it ran off. He paused and thought for a moment. Actually, I think I should clarify that. What it had lost interest in was eating us. 
The thing was interested in us, but more as a supplier. What made us realize this is that we would run into it from time to time, and since we're in the business of collecting stowaways, we'd end up presenting its food much like we had before. Over time, we realized that as long as we fed it, it pretty much just left us alone. Stephen chimed in. Why don't you tell her what else we've figured out about it? Ah, David said. Forgot the most important part. He took his hands away and started pacing around again. We found ourselves being followed one day after collecting our stowaway, and we don't really care to have witnesses around. I found my curiosity piping up again, so we let him follow us while we did our usual routine of feeding our new pet. Once it had its dinner, I spotted our witness in the trees out there and simply pointed in his direction. Our problem was taken care of without any hesitation, David chuckled again, a very useful asset in our line of work. He stopped his explanation and sighed. Stephen continued for him. Unfortunately, we haven't seen our pet in a while, and it's starting to worry us. We would like it if it would continue to not eat us and do us favors when we need it. So that's what we've got you for. He smiled that unsettling smile again. My heart was trying to pound its way out of my chest. In a panic, I rolled myself off the altar, landing hard on the marble floor. I scrambled to my feet and made a break for it. Stephen started to come after me, but David stopped him. Let her go. It won't matter. Bong! I stopped running. What the hell is that? I asked with a tremble in my voice. The dinner bell, David answered. I realized where Alejandro had gone off to, and my dislike for him immediately leveled out with the other two. Bong! I looked around the church frantically. My heart stopped as I saw something moving in the corner by the ceiling. A large, dark, arachnid-like thing crept out from the shadows. It crawled down from the wall over the altar and straight down the aisle towards me. I couldn't move. As it came closer, I could see hands at the end of every black appendage, except for the praying mantis-like front claws that looked metallic and sharp. Its body and head, other than the abdomen, which was very much like a large spider's, was long, pale, almost human. The face had two human-like cloudy eyes, but no nose or mouth. I fell back as the thing towered over me, opened my mouth to scream, but no sound came out. The thing's claws slammed down, digging into and cracking the marble floor on either side of me. It lowered its face down to mine as the bottom half of its face began to rip apart we were feeling a countless number of fangs. Its mouth hung open for me as if to make sure I could see each and every one of them. The brain is a funny thing sometimes. In this moment of absolute horror and bracing myself for my doom, my mind flashed back to the blood and feathers that I had found underneath my bird feeder this morning. And the morning before that. And the morning before that. As long as we fed it. The thing was still standing over me, but it wasn't making any more advances toward me. I prayed to God I wasn't sure I believed in, and pointed in the direction of my captors. I watched as Alejandro walked back down the stairs. He screamed upon seeing the remains of his friends strewn out over the church floor, the only sound I heard him make all night. Tears were streaming down his face, when he turned his head towards me in disbelief, as I politely asked, Do you think you can give me a ride home? Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to this story in its entirety. If you enjoy what you hear and what I do and would like to support me and my efforts, visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Otis if you haven't yet, please hit the like button and subscribe today and share this video with everyone on your social media. It helps more than you could ever imagine.
Again, thank you for listening and have a great day. God bless you.